is a guarantee is when there are very alternative philosophies to underpin education. So if an education worldwide that does not have a philosophy automatically assumes the Western cultural framework as its default. That is where many countries play the game of education, but they know the beautiful ones are not yet born. Do you get me? So it depends where you want to pitch your campaign. You can do it the other way, or you can walk the road less traveled. But it's very precious, you know, in these past three decades, sunk their teeth, and crisis management took over throughout the continent, bringing along forced recourse to pragmatism and a techno-bureaucratic orientation. The whole idea of a philosophy or ideology was deemed to be a most undesirable baggage to be discarded with rapidity. In fact, there was gross impatience to these ideologies and philosophies. One could do a separate research on what happened to the Tanzanian thing. In fact, the best thing we can celebrate today is that this assault on the emerging African sense of identity took place when countries like Tanzania had already internalized their ideology. To such an extent, you cannot destabilize a Tanzanian easily. They are at peace with their simple and relatively, they know they are not endowed uh, in terms of material. But you're not going to come and tell them, so therefore you are so miserable. So therefore, and they will just look at you. Because they have got a philosophy to understand and comprehend their reality, which was unshakable. All the other countries where we run around with statistics trying to terrify them and so on are the ones who do not have a grounding of self. They have they didn't money together, for example. So moreover, it appears that somewhere in the process of collapsing all other moods and forms of learning and education systems into the narrow process of schooling, the African society and its identity, its cultures and its uniqueness, they lost out in that transaction completely. African societies which had no resemblance to the European society had to be subjected to various forms of structural change involving streamlining its political, social, cultural and economic structures. Since the beginning of the colonial era, therefore, it would appear that modernization theory's requirement that all societies must develop along particular <coughs> stages, and that these stages need to be accompanied with psychological attributes as a condition for stable and consistent economic growth, put another nail to the burial coffin of diversity, and with that, the right of African societies to be. So next time you talk about diversity, think about this. Analyze this and figure out how come diversity is so hard to implement. I was in a panel uh, with the, at the, uh, UNESCO with the Director General and the Commissioner for Education of the European Union. And after the discussions, we were still on the rostrum and I turned to the Commissioner and I said, you see, next time we are going to talk about cultural conflict and conflict resolution at a global level, the moderator should not be Europe. Why? Because Europe is wired badly. It is wired to hierarchize everybody else. It's in, incapable of comprehending a world of horizontality. You get me? It just doesn't have, the default drive is what is defective. So it can make claims, verbal claims, but its wiring system <coughs> just doesn't sit with that kind of thing. It must look for hierarchy everywhere it goes. So when the aspiration is for an emancipated, you know, democratically driven world, that's where the, it just says virus. When you now insert the European software virus, because it does, it does not, and it doesn't do it. It states it, and it it does it in house within Europe, but it does not know how to do that as a global exercise. That's why when it tries to support things that 
go global, it turns out into these very toxic processes of conditionalities and so on and so Nothing genuine about the possibility of an emancipated whole. Silence has since then been safely maintained over whose nomit, the normative heritage is in transmission through education. And for educators, the concern has become skewed to focus mainly on the business of ensuring enrollment, more expansion of retention in schools, of ensuring quality provision, of achievement, of careers, blah, 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 blah. Hmm? Uh, now it is knowledge economy, of course. Hmm? <coughs> now, through the structural adjustment programs and the ensuing conditionalities, the undermining of national sovereignty of African states became a norm rather than an exception. This has gone hand in hand with the usurping of the ideological and philosophical basis upon which any autonomous meaning of things like development or education uh, could be constituted. In other words, that African society is no longer at ease and that its basic metabolism what has been systematically destroyed appears to have been totally missed in all projects of educational reform. Instead of carrying out its expected role of social reproduction and renewal that is essential for the progress of any society, education in Africa pursues with relentlessness <coughs> its opposite mandate, which is that of reducing the basic metabolism of African society and dismantling the elements of social reproduction. This is the real project of education. So without Africa coming up with clear and proactive philosophy to poise education to the challenges of Africa's regeneration 21st century, education's strategic role will continue to be to make available basically to the overseas investor, both a docile, stable, and an organized workforce, because the global process is allergic to unions also, for instance. So the next step, in, uh, apart from the African, let's say, rural population that are organized very differently, the next level of organization is the, is a, is a trade unions, and trade union uh, corporations are absolutely allergic to that also. So that means the issue is to create docile, stable, rather disorganized workforce who can <laughs> validate and legitimize the political presence and definitely the superiority of these uh, overseas systems. And education in the post-colonial <coughs> era, remember what Nyerere said, was to be for self-reliance, economically, politically, cultural, and psychologically. Otherwise, he warned us, you will teach to produce clerks as colonialists did. You will not be teaching fighters, but a bunch of slaves and semi-slaves. Get your pupils out of that mentality. But of course, to get them out, you must be out of it. You have to produce tough people, stubborn youths who can do something, not hopeless youths. So the principle of several lines, just to remind ourselves, have as their cornerstone, the consistent emphasis that people and people alone are the motive for. It is not overseas investment. It is people and people alone that who are the motive force in making world history. People have creative power and therefore self-reliance implies regeneration through one's efforts. It's different from self-sufficiency in that it is about fighting dominance by beginning to rely on oneself and the collective self <coughs> with others in the same position. It entails participation and solidarity, and in the global context, self-reliance is a dynamic movement from the periphery and by, you sorry, at all levels, individual, local, and regional. In other words, you want to do something, link with self-reliance initiatives, at, which are already happening at that global, at that local level. Figure out your way.